is uh, the, the his whole life. You forget his life, how he was born, how he was raised, what Texas was like. For God's sake. In September of 2002, on the TV this morning, we're still fighting about water. Lyndon Johnson grew up in a damn tough world. Right? Okay, so you're looking for the flavor of the man. Flavor of the man. Well, and, these stories. And, 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 you know, these anecdotes that you're talking about, we want those too. And rather than the political science. Well, in the Harry, you know, I do think from all these years that... I mean, you remember how emotional I could get. Try and recap just the last minute. Okay. Okay. So to continue and briefly, I'm standing right behind the president's left shoulder with Jim Jones. The final addendum comes up on the teleprompter. We're still not certain whether he's going to open his mouth or not. We really weren't sure. Certainly no heart in the room wanted him to do it. But he opened his mouth and he said the first four words and there were three separate gasps. You could hear them, they're on the tape. Two of the signal men, and I don't know who the other one was. It wasn't me because in the photos my mouth is closed. And it wasn't Jim. But that was the measure of the shock. Right down to him to his opening his mouth. We didn't know whether he was going to do it or not. And of course then we learned historically that there was a prior occasion. It wasn't it when he when he actually had a withdrawal speech in his pocket going up to the, to the hill? I think so. But to close it off, to give you some measure of what Lyndon Johnson was like as a man, what do you do after resigning the American presidency? Your family was there, your wife and your two daughters, What do you do? Do you go take a swim? Do you go and bowl a frame down in the EOB? Do you get on the phone? The country is now in shock. The world. Shock. The best kept secret of the entire Johnson presidency. What Lyndon Johnson did within an hour <clears throat> was to pass the word and have other people pass the word that he was receiving friends upstairs in the yellow room. And when I walked in there were at least 20 people already there. A lot of them had obviously rushed to the West Wing. They were in the hall and he was sitting in a chair by himself, and I think he was wearing what we all used to laugh at. We call it his Imelda Marco shirt. This Philippine kind of baggy blouse. That's my recollection. And it was the most awkward moment. <laughs> Nobody knew what to say. There were a few brave souls. I think Joe Fowler yielded to the human impulse, a lot of tears and a lot of eyes, and a little, little mini eulogies of the president. Some people, I recall, said you're doing the right thing. But the interesting thing, as I recall, is I'm certain there was no presidential statement. There was no exposition. He sat there. He looked fine. He looked normal. 
He looked relaxed. Not as if any cliché great weight had been lifted off of his shoulder. Not that kind of relaxation, but and not a not a peace. But it was a very strange hour. He just made himself available to his staff and his friends. And when you look back, it was a rather wonderful and a very generous thing to do. These were his people. It was certainly one of the biggest nights of their lives too. <clears throat> I think it only, well, it went on a fairly good time, maybe an hour, an hour and a half. And then we all wandered off. I guess we all went home, kind of stunned. And the next morning we all come back and went to work. The president was the president. I've been asked <clears throat> many times, as I'm sure anybody who had been in close proximity to Lyndon Johnson is asked, <clears throat> of all the questions that seem to come to people, given the nature of his personality, his personality his temperament, his style, warts and all, the bark off, his outrageousness, his size, his physique, his physical size. What people want to know is, what was he really like? And that's a damn good question. It may be the ultimate question. First, I came to think to myself that Lyndon Johnson is incapable of concealing himself. He could be very politically clever. He could play as good a hand of political poker as anybody in the world, but There was a phrase of the day, which I always rather liked. Lyndon Johnson, let it all hang out. For better or worse, he had a hell of a temper, thank God. Secondly, the word I always associate with this president his passion. He was an enormously passionate man. I mean passion in the sense of fire in the belly. They were the days when Martin Luther King was talking about, I have a dream. But Lyndon Johnson had that dream 40 years before. It was the way he was born the way he was brought up, the way that family struggled, it was being a Texan, it was being raw boned, it was being, in a way, an underprivileged young man, teaching at a tiny little college, climbing the ladder, finding FDR, finding the Congress, and climbing the ladder by force of belief. Belief in America. Fire in the belly. Those of us who slip into calling him, you know, this force of nature, he was. He had this enormous energy. He wanted everything done yesterday and he had 10,000 ideas for tomorrow. 
and he wanted every one of them done. He was in a hell of a hurry, and it was all passion. In my life, after 35 years in Washington politics, every presidential campaign since 1964, intimate with four presidential candidates, only one of whom won, the wrong one, Carter. It's hard not to say they're not LBJ. The, tr the nation changed, the presidency certainly changed, and is changing. The cabinet changed. But what I miss in my life, and what I lecture my children about to a point of their dismay, is the lack of passion. We have become a nation who value one word above all, nice. You have to be nice. Think of what happened to Gore when he finally went after Bush in the 2000 campaign. The media ripped him apart for being tough, too strong, too critical, they were too mean. He was mean to little Georgie. You can't do that in today's America. Think about it. There's nobody can commit any crime in America today at any level except the poor and go to court and with a good lawyer win and then go on the TV talk circuit and apologize. Everything is held up to the sacred standard of be nice. Well, who's got news for anybody? Nice guys finish last. And when you're the President of the United States, whether it's Lyndon Johnson against Ho Chi Minh or George Bush against Saddam Hussein, nice guys don't cut it. War is nasty. Politics is nasty. The White House is a nasty place. Power is nasty. Many of us have thought about what a second Lyndon Johnson term would have been like. Granting all the unknowns. Does anybody in this country still have any doubt that we would not have enlarged and re-energized the Great Society program? Would this country still be without a national health care program? Would we still be without discount drugs for our senior citizens? Would we still be talking about privatizing Social Security in the interest of big business? I don't think so. What the Republicans have been trying to do for 40 years, 35 but more distant than that, maybe 80 years, is to unravel the Great Society program. My last hurrah was in the campaign of 2000 with Bill Bradley. <clears throat> I've known Bill for eight years. <clears throat> for four of those years, I was a member of a very small group, seven people, who wanted him to run for the president. He finally decided that he would do it. It was an awful campaign. 
Why I wanted Bill Bradley and why I would still want him is because Bradley thinks for himself and acts for himself. He doesn't need staff. He doesn't need advisors. He's got passion and belief. He's Lyndon Johnson. He's even taller. So one of the few successes I had in that rather miserable campaign was <clears throat> the month <clears throat> when Bradley began to receive these speeches and policy papers pointing out your great commitment to civil rights, you using this campaign to crusade for the minorities of America, particularly African Americans, was Lyndon Johnson's great crusade. And the greatest victories of the Democratic Party were orchestrated personally by the sitting president, Lyndon Johnson. And we now know that Bill gave four separate speeches on this. <clears throat> and I can tell you personally, was very happy to do so because he's a Democrat. We forget these things because the lines between the parties are blurred now. But it says a lot about the inability of the American electorate to maybe understand and rally behind the Bill Bradleys of the world that we got nowhere. Instead, we wind up with Gore and Bush. And it troubles me. Because without the passion, without a clear belief, what George Bush the first was forced to grapple with as, quote, the vision thing, I mean, how embarrassing for the United States of America, particularly Lyndon Johnson's America, to have to grapple with the vision thing. The only thing America is, is a vision. You gotta go to work to make the vision real. So, <clears throat> what troubles me most, <clears throat> thinking about there being a Lyndon Johnson today, or even a Bill Bradley today, I think these great tectonic changes in American society, for us of us here in Washington <clears throat> and those around the country who are involved in politics and public policy, there have been two huge occurrences that none of us saw back in the 60s. It's the convergence of money and media. The media want you to be nice, although they'd always love to get you to pick a fight on TV. George Bush had all the campaign in 2000, all the campaign money he would ever meet, ever need, in what, three weeks? We're still battling for campaign finance reform, and it's a total failure. This McCain-Feingold bill won't work, because the country doesn't want it to work, because the corporations and the special interests will not let it work. Unlike Senator Lyndon Johnson, think of the gulf between the reality of how did Lyndon Johnson and Dick Russell 
and Bob Kerr and Russell Long and Sam Rayburn. How did that generation pay for their campaigns? Because today, there isn't a single member of either chamber on the Hill who doesn't understand the absolute reality. I can't do it without money. I can't keep my job or I can't get elected without money. I've thought about this <clears throat> and I've been, I've been careful for about a year to try and not to overstate it. But we lost John Gardner a few months ago and I worked with John on Common Cause since he founded it. It's my belief that on the mall in Washington today there is an answer to the classic historical and political science question who governs? The answer is, in today's America, money governs, without exception. And the sign on the mall is a realtor's sign, a real estate agent's sign, and it says, for sale. This government is for sale, top to bottom. And as a nation, and as a people, and as a political society, we haven't been able to find an alternative. I don't have the answer. So we keep pecking away at campaign finance reform, which is good. Let's see what happens. But my personal and professional belief is the problem is too big. The power of money is too massive and too pervasive. We have what maybe Pat Moynihan would call the dumbing down of democracy. Democracy today means lobbies, litigation, and lemmings. The lemmings who rush off the cliff without knowing who the hell is pushing them. Don't want to win on a down note, Harry. Let me come back to this fascinating question of <clears throat> what was he really like? I was on Air Force One going down to the ranch, I suppose. I don't know, 66. Kind of early for me. <clears throat> and uh, McNamara was up in the cabin and I heard his voice, the president's voice, crying out, Charles, Charles! Typical. So I get up and walk back and he's sitting in his chair with McNamara beside him and he says, you're one of these goddamn intellectuals. You and your New York long hair liberal friends. So you tell me, what the hell is larger than life? What are they saying about me? I saw McNamara snigger. And all I remember saying is, <clears throat> Mr. President, it's a compliment. He looked at me and says, you sure about that? McNamara made a nice joke. He said, well, Mr. President, I'm not saying you're too fat which eased things a bit. And then I made a mistake. I looked down at him with a smile and I said, you know, in a larger context, Mr. President, it's kind of interesting. Why don't I check it out and send you a little memo? And his favorite, he loved this. He said, yeah, good idea, do that. Larger than life. And as I walked away, I heard this, larger than life, larger than life. <laughs> uh, 
I was sitting at my desk. I happened to check a memo to be sure about this. <clears throat> the memo is to Bill Moyers and Douglas Cater. And the first line says, the president called at 11.20 p.m. tonight. That was what he was like. I don't think anybody ever called him a workaholic because he was larger than that. He worked all the time. And I picked up the phone, his voice says, are you a writer? And I said, Mr. President, this is Charles McGuire. And he said, Charles, come on over here, I'm over in the mansion. So these were these awful times when the President of the United States was going around turning out the lights in the White House at night to save the taxpayers' money. And uh, I still really didn't know my way around the mansion. So I remember winding up for some reason over on the portico by the Rose Garden, and I'm stumbling around in the dark. A Secret Service man finally points me in the elevator. I get in. I get out. There's a guard of some kind standing at a big door. I walked over and I said, McGuire. And he says, inside. I open the door. Now remember, this is now about midnight. And I walked in, and literally my heart leaped into my throat because what I saw was a North Vietnamese attacking the President of the United States, who for some reason was naked. The President is on his massage table, and this little Asian is up on top of his shoulders, jabbing away at him, pounding away at him. His head is turned away from me. He's on his stomach with this little white towel. That's all. <clears throat> he hauls himself up on an elbow, looks at me, he says, What am I going to do with you goddamn New York liberals? How many times do I have to tell Moyers and Cater the 18 years aren't 18 year olds aren't going to get the vote? and he's climbing off the goddamn table, working himself up into a real lather. And I made up my mind instantly that the one thing I am going to do is keep my eyes fixed on his eyes until he dropped the goddamn towel. So I have this enraged, naked President of the United States screaming about the goddamn liberals and this god awful speech and I've told him ten times I'm not going to give this goddamn speech and he went on and on and on and then he turned around <laughs> the Texas family jewels were handsomely on display and he could care less I guess that's another definition of passion. <clears throat> His references to long hairs were not exclusively directed at me, <clears throat> but there were too many times when you would be walking through the corridors of the White House. I remember once I was upstairs walking down the corridor towards the uh, cabinet room. And I was aware of some kind of a group behind me in the president's voice, <clears throat> but I didn't look around because it was none of my business. And I kept walking until suddenly my head is yanked back and he's got my hair in his hand and he's bellowing at me, 
Didn't I tell you to get your goddamn hair cut? Didn't I put a goddamn barbershop right down there beside your dime office? Two days later, I still have a little buck slip from the President's Secretary, Juanita Roberts, the little yellow thing, and all it says is, Mr. McGuire, the President wants to know, did you get a haircut? That's what he was like. He never forgot anything. You talk about micromanagement. <clears throat> I fired back at him a couple of times. What was he like? Micromanagement? It was a very stressful week in the White House and a particularly long nights and days and sitting at my desk, the POTUS line went, that shrill, uninterrupted demand from heaven. And I picked it up and I said, yes, Mr. President. And he went into a tirade. Do you know what day it is? I got this speech here on the book slip. That, isn't that your pink slip on the top of that thing? He knew damn well it was. And I said, yes, sir. He says, well, I'm looking at this goddamn book slip and it says it's June 7th. Charles, what day is it? Do you know what goddamn day it is? And I'm getting steamed. I said, I tried to sidestep, and he says, Oh, so you don't know what day it is? You don't know what day it is? And I couldn't believe it. I finally said, Mr. President, I don't know what day it is, and sir, I don't give a damn. And I hung up. My secretaries were appalled. What would he like? What do you think he would have done? Rebuke you? Punish you? He was a great punisher. No, he was more clever than that. He didn't do anything. Let him twist in the wind. About four days later, the real cunning of Lyndon Johnson came through. I began to hear from people like Walt Rostow, Dean Rusk, a couple of cabinet secretaries phoned to describe meetings with the president. A typical meeting was at the end, Lyndon stood up talking about all his problems as a president. I'm not getting this done. I'm not getting that done. You people are probably, you think you're, you're, you're useless to me. He reached in his back pocket, pulled out the, the, the day's body count, says, I got, I'm looking at almost 50,000 young American boys dead. Nobody's doing anything. This goddamn place is going to hell. And you know what? Let me tell you the worst thing. I got a man downstairs who doesn't know what goddamn day it is. <laughs> and of course, I was identified immediately. One of the great moments, and I'll try and wind this up, is back to my favorite theme of Nixon. This was a glorious moment. The president had sent around a memo drafted by Joe Calfano, enormously presidential, explaining why Mr. Nixon's transition staff would have the utmost cooperation because he was going to be the new president of the United States. Da 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 da. We were all so pissed off. They were uh, sending small groups around Haldeman and Ehrlichman and that little press secretary bastard Ziegler, Jim Keough, 
And then there came my turn. Um, so the three of them walked into my office. <clears throat> there was a couch. One of them sat on the couch and there were two chairs and <clears throat> I wasn't going to give them anything. I had completely forgotten the president's memorandum. I'm sure I tore it up and threw it away immediately. I was loaded for bear. So I was giving them monosyllabic answers. In the ceiling of my office, which had been converted, I was told, from a giant safe, there was a square indentation. You could see the four lines of the square. If you had time to look at the ceiling of an office. So halfway into the meeting or so, well, it's not going very well. I'm giving them nothing, stonewalling like crazy, smiling, basically saying, yes, no, I don't know. Looking them right in the eye. This little guy over here, I think it was Ziegler, finally coughs and says, Oh, excuse me, is that a trap door up there in the ceiling? And I turned to him and said, yes, Mr. Ziegler, it is, and it's a very special trap door. And he said, why is that? And I said, because it connects to the president's toilet, and when he doesn't like what you're doing, he flushes. <laughs> they got so pissed. They were out of there in 30 seconds. And I'm dancing around. I told everybody. I got him. I got him. The next morning, the president wants to see you immediately. I don't think I connected it. I walked in and he was in the little office. Scene of Mr. Clinton's Mr. Niemers. Lyndon Johnson, what was he like? Lyndon Johnson loved to, to set you up. He loved to have you at the center of the bullseye and start a way out here and move and move and move his way in. And he began to talk to me about that great, he used the word magisterial speech that you wrote on the American presidency the sanctity of the office, the sacredness of the office, all these great presidents, and I still didn't get it. And he's circling around, he says, and last week or a week ago, I asked the staff to, you know, give this incoming American president standing also, as Charles, as you said, in the line from George Washington on, I asked you, to treat his staff and the new president with the respect that I would. And it suddenly dawned on me and I said, oh shit. <laughs> and I jumped in. I said, <clears throat> Mr. President, I, <clears throat> I apologize to you if I upset the small group yesterday. And he says, you apologize to me. Would you apologize to President Nixon? And I said, well, I don't think that will be necessary. And he says, oh, he knows all about it. Did you actually tell his staff that the President of the United States shits on you? Anyway, he really blistered my ass. He wouldn't stop. He kept coming back to this magnificent speech. You're a scholar, you're a gentleman, you're a historian, you're brilliant, you could be president. Jack Bellini says you'd be president. You actually told them that I shit on you? There's a good place to stop. <laughs> <laughs> I have never